your day at UC University's World of Tomorrow conference. My name is Rafael Samarov. I'm a student on the Medical Ethics Society uh, for UC University. So this morning's session will reflect the world of medicine and medical ethics, opportunities, and challenges of the world of tomorrow. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, Rabbi Mordechai Willig, Yeshiva University, Rabbi Dr. Saul Roth, Professor of Talmud and Contemporary Halakha. Rabbi Willig has served as spiritual leader of the Young Israel in Riverdale in the Bronx, New York, since 1974. Rabbi Willig is also deputy of based in based in America and an outspoken advocate of the Halakha Prenuptial Agreement as a preventative measure against the creation of Abigail. Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman is a professor of emergency medicine and bioethics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He received his rabbinic coordination from REITS and writes and lectures internationally in the field of Jewish medical ethics. Rabbi Reichman has served as a mentor to the Medical Ethics Society of Yeshiva University since its inception. His research is devoted to the interface of medical history and Jewish law. And now, please enjoy the session on New Frontiers of Medicine and Halakha. Good morning, everybody. A uh, tremendous pleasure, honor, as to be here, Rabbi Shiva, It's always a to uh, to share the podium with Rabbi Willig, and I look forward to a uh, an animated, futuristic discussion with uh, with all of you. Uh, to begin, I'd like to draw your attention um, to the handout, to the illustration on the upper right hand side of the handout. Uh, I found this illustration uh, within the last year or so, and it really uh, struck me. Uh, I think this should be the new uh, logo for Yeshiva University. Um, and it, it reflects our discussion today on many different levels. Uh, on level one, uh, the uh, Chazal teach us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu istakel bo'araiso bo'ra'alma, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu looked into the Torah, used the Torah as the blueprint, if you will, uh, for the world, and, uh, and the DNA is, is in a sense our, uh, our blueprint uh, for, the, uh, for the human body. Um, but more so apropos for Yeshiva University, uh, it really reflects the fact that Torah is in our DNA, uh, and it's an integral part of our DNA. And this, uh, this really reflects, in a classic sense, the, uh, the interrelationship between, uh, between Torah and Mata, which we, in this session, are going to do today, as we look towards the future. Um, just to ask a question, and it's okay if, if no one responds to this question, I'm curious if, if anyone here had a specific issue that they thought should or might be addressed in this, uh, in this session. Anybody? Uh... Okay, that's great, no problem. So they, uh, they tell the story of a, uh, of a scientist who approached HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, we can do a lot of things that you can do, God. We can treat patients at the end of life. We can treat them at the beginning of life. We can even make man just like you did. We don't really need you anymore. So uh, Kaj Baruch turns to the scientist and says, you can make man? How do you do such a thing? So he says, well, uh, I uh, take some dirt and I, uh, and I bring it to the lab and I uh, inject some enzymes into it. So Kaj Baruch says, why don't you show me? So the scientist proceeds to bend down and pick up the dirt, and God says, no, 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 you get your own dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is true that scientists today think they can control every single dimension of life from beginning of life, before the beginning of life, till after death. Uh, there is so much that we could potentially talk about in a session like this, so obviously our session is going to be limited. Uh, we're going to highlight some of the scientific aspects. Some of the scientific aspects haven't even yet been discussed from a halachic perspective, may not even have direct halachic ramifications. Many of them will have halachic ramifications. My role on this panel is to share with you the scientific aspects. And, uh, and Rabbi Willig Shlita will be addressing the, uh, the halachic ramifications of some of these issues. So I'll highlight, we may or may not get to everything on this, uh, on this handout today, but I'll highlight, highlight some of the uh, very interesting aspects. Um, by the way, just a promo for an upcoming session, one of the major advances which we will not be discussing significantly in this session, uh, as we begin in the world of genetics, which is the uh, beginning of life, uh, is the uh, field of uh, CRISPR. Uh, how many people by show of hands have, are familiar with that acronym, 
uh, CRISPR. So a fair, fair number of you, almost all of you, are familiar with the, uh, with the acronym CRISPR. CRISPR is a, uh, a real paradigm shift and game changer in the world of genetics. Uh, it's the ability for scientists to perform genetic manipulation on the cells of the human body and even on the embryos, human embryos, with the ability to uh, alter human disease and, frankly, the ability to alter every aspect of both human beings and animals and even uh, plants uh, and many of the brios of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So just as a commercial for an upcoming session, the Medical Ethics Society, Mir Hashem, will be having its uh, annual conference December 10th uh, and one of the major sessions there will be a discussion about, uh, about the CRISPR uh, technology. But what I'd like to, uh, to begin with here today is, is a topic uh, which has interestingly been on, been on the burner uh, in the halachic world just this past year in a number of different uh, ways. Uh, and for those of you who, uh, who left basic biology uh, a long time ago and haven't returned to it, this will bring back some, uh, some bad memories for you. Um, it's... Uh, it's actually all about a particular organelle called the mitochondria. I would say that this year in the world of halacha has been the year of the mitochondria. Uh, how so? First of all, what is the mitochondria and how is the mitochondria relevant in the world of halacha? Uh, the mitochondria is a, a small organelle that sits in the uh, liquid or the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, and you may or may not recall that while the overwhelming majority of human genes are found within the nucleus of the cell, 99.99% of the, of the genes, there are actually chromosomes, there are actually genes that are found in the uh, mitochondria as well. Uh, and you may recall, um, I think actually on page two of your handout, I believe, on the top of page two, um, British court decides Charlie Gard will be moved to a hospice to die. How many people are familiar with the Charlie Gard case? Uh, many of you have heard of the Charlie Gard case. This is a very tragic case of a child in England who suffered from a severe disease uh, and, uh, and needed uh, help. Unfortunately, the prognosis is very poor. Uh, the issues that that raised we are not going to discuss in this session. Uh, but for uh, relevant to our session, the disease that he carried was a disease of the mitochondria. So while the mitochondria only have very few genes, uh, literally in the tens, sometimes those genes can be defective, and those genes uh, can cause disease, sometimes even fatal disease, as in the case of Charlie Gard. So what is the solution now for that? So today, there is an ability for a family who knows that they are carrying defective genes in the mitochondria to do what's called mitochondrial transfer. <clears throat> mitochondrial transfer is the following. You have a woman who has defective mitochondria. You harvest her egg. You literally remove the nucleus from her egg, then take the egg of another woman, woman B, remove her nucleus, and replace it with the nucleus of woman A. So what you have as an end result is a composite egg with the nucleus of woman A and the normal mitochondria of woman B. Then you can fertilize that egg with the zera of woman A's husband and produce a child. Um, therefore, for the first time really in history, you have a, a child that's a composite of genes from three people. You have the genes from the nuclear donor, the genes from the mitochondrial donor, and the, uh, the genes from the male donor. So in the halakhic world, one of the issues, which is one of the most complex issues in the last 10, 20 years, has been the issue of definition of maternity. Who's considered a halakhic mother of a child? Uh, there is no consensus on this topic. Many people hold it's the birth mother. Many people hold it's the genetic mother. Uh, most important question is to whom do you send a card on Mother's Day? Very important question. Hallmark holds all mothers are considered the, uh, the halachic mothers. Um, but even if you hold the genetic mother is considered the halachic mother, the question now from a halachic perspective, if you hold genetics as the determinant, now you have two genetic contributors. You have the nuclear genetic mother and the mitochondrial genetic mothers. So you can imagine a child saying to their mother, you can't discipline me like that. You're only my mitochondrial mother. So I turn to uh, Willingsley to, to address the halach ramifications of the definition of maternity, in particular in this very new advance of uh, mitochondrial transfer. Thank you, Dr. Reichman. I'm happy to discuss it. But I would like to say that it extends 
significantly beyond the terrible uh, Charlie Garb, which is a rarity, a very, very rare case, to the following situation, which is much, much more common. As many of you are aware, a woman can sometimes have defective eggs and is unable to have a child of her own. This leads to uh, IVF with donor eggs, where the main controversy exists as to who is the mother. But in many, many cases, I will not venture a guess in the statistics, could be even most of the cases, that the woman's eggs are defective. What's really defective is my mitochondria, not the nucleus, especially as women get older. So therefore, the question now becomes, a woman is a little bit older, she gets married, the doctor gives her the bad news, you're not going to be able to have your own child because your, your eggs are defective. So typically, she's going to turn to the possibility of a donor egg, total donor egg. The donor egg is whether halachically it's her child or not her child, but genetically it's completely not her child. So the child will not resemble her in any which way. However, if one can offer this new solution, namely that she offer her defective egg, the nucleus, which is not defective, is taken out of her defective egg and placed in the mitochondria of somebody else's egg, you have the possibility in significant cases, not just in a rare case of Charlie God, in, we'll say millions of cases, but in the Jewish community, certainly thousands of cases, where the woman can have the best of all worlds. In other words, right now she can't have a child at all. IVF, not really her child. It's, it's uh, again, genetically, leave out the halacha. My inclination is that the genetic mother is the mother. I know, I know there are others who disagree strongly. But put that aside. Aside from the hala, pure halachic issue, she wants someone who's going to be like her. Most people want children, I mean, many reasons psychologically. You want to have a continuation in this world. And if the child will have her genetic makeup, there'll be a more of a continuation than if it's some, someone else's genetic makeup, even though she may be the one carrying in her womb. So we can perhaps suggest that as a better alternative, again, if it's permissible by American law, which is not so clear right now, and Jewish law, which is also not so clear. But if it's permissible by both legal systems, would not be a preferred method to enable her to have a child artificially, that the child will actually be her genetic child because her nucleus is working fine, and only the mitochondria is supplied by the donor. So again, I'm just expanding the question from the particular case of Charlie God, which is a very, very rare, as we said, to a much, much more common situation which exists to people in, in our part of the world. So once again, as you can imagine, anything new in the world is a subject of a halakhic dispute. Do we say that this individual has three parents, a father and two mothers, or not? So, before you get to this particular case of splitting off the nucleus of the mitochondria, there are those who claim that in all situations of donor eggs, there are three parents. The father, the donor, and the birth mother. I've always found this to be totally counterintuitive from a lot of respect. There's one mother. Make up your mind. It's either this one or that one. Can I prove that I'm right? No. Nothing is, can be absolutely proven in this world of tomorrow. But given the fact that I, my halakhic intuition is only one mother, in the case of the <coughs> total uh, egg donor, my inclination is there's only one mother here too. And if you have to make a choice of who the mother is, again, assuming that it's a genetic mother, not the birth mother, once you make that assumption, it seems to me as a double portion, it should be obvious that as you call it, the 99.9% uh, genetic mother should be the halakhic mother. So that therefore not only should she have her child genetically, uh, as we said earlier, but they would even be considered her halachic child. And as you said, the mother's they caught uh, would have to go to her, uh, notwithstanding <laughs> the fact that the mitochondria is coming from somebody else. Uh, the halachists discuss it. The, uh, Rabbi Usher Weiss discusses it. He's always on the cutting edge of, of uh, the latest medical advances. I believe he comes to the same conclusion and rejects the logic of others that Dover Hamam and Lo Potl and things of this nature. There's no way, I, I, he's right, in my opinion. There's no relevance to our present discussion. 
So, in, in my opinion, in this situation, uh, you said the year of the mitochondria, correct. And we'll get to the second part later, which we'll in, a, in a moment. But um, in my view, in such a case, if it were to be done, we had to make a ruling, we would rule that the genetic mother, which means the nucleus genetic mother, is the mother, and there's one father and there's one mother, and the woman who provided the nucleus of her egg is the halachic mother. May you do it? This is after the fact. May you do it? Well, go back a step. There are those who feel that no donations are permissible. By now, almost everyone agrees that IVF is permissible for the husband and the wife, who cannot have a child normally, but can have a child with his sperm and her egg, which although 30 years ago the rabbis were up in arms, this is terrible, this is the worst thing in the world, now they will come around to my knowledge. I think everyone agrees that that's okay by now. But when you start with donors, there are still many great rabbis who are unalterably opposed to any kind of sperm donation, egg donation, against all donations. But let's assume that donations in general are permissible, which we do assume. Frankly, sperm donations is more halakhically complex than, than egg donations uh, from the Mamzeri's perspective. We're not going there, it's not part of the session today. But Nicholas uh, Moshe Paskins is no issue of Mamzeri's even with respect to sperm donations, certainly with respect to egg donations. This is a little more complex. There, it's, <laughs> there was a, uh, remember, the, remember the boost to sperm yeah, controversy? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, that's baloney. That's, bolo- that's pure baloney. No such thing. Just to make the guy feel good, they throw, throw some of his stuff in too. But here it's for real. This is for real. You have a, com- a combination of components of the nucleus and the mitochondria. Uh, may that be done. In my opinion, it's permissible if there's no other alternative. I'm very sympathetic to a woman who wants to have her child with her genes, not just carrying in her womb, and therefore, though they have some misgivings, can't say no, but at the end of the day, I cannot find a clear prohibition. In my opinion, it's permissible. Just a, a follow-up question for the Rav. If the mitochondrial donor is not Jewish, does, does the child require any form of uh, gerus misafek? Uh, could that child grow up and marry a, a Kohen? Um, I would say as follows. <laughs> these, are t- these are tough questions which haven't come to us yet. I mean, uh, we don't have these. No, these no, the mice hasn't no happened yet. Yeah. So I don't want to be bound in 20 years from now when someone yeah. comes to me. <laughs> uh, I am that person and wants to marry a Cohen. My inclination is that the, the person may marry a Cohen because the the uh, again going back to my original feeling that this genetic mother is the mother. If it's the birth mother, it's the mother. The birth mother is also Jewish in this case. We're discussing a situation where the birth mother uh, is the genetic mother. It's the same person. This is only a mitochondrial donor who's not Jewish. Right? So I would say, if push came to shove, I would say that the child may marry a Cohen. At the same time, since we always like to be cautious when we can be, I would say that it can't hurt have this child undergo what we call the gear, the chumrah. I would call it the chumrah bi'alma, not just chumrah. For all situations of whether it's surrogacy or donor eggs, we all, everyone requires a gear, the chumrah, because no one knows who's exactly right. In my view, the gear, the, we've done both. Well, actually, the, the same day I once did both. We had the same, we had a gear, the chumrah from someone from a surrogate, non Jewish surrogate, a Jewish, Jewish egg. And the same day, we're doing a gear, the chumrah, the other way around, from, which is the more common case of a Jewish mother carrying from a donor, non-Jewish donor. Which one will the real gayers stand up? Which is the real, really, really required? My inclination is the one that's really required is the non-Jewish uh, donor egg as opposed to the non-Jewish surrogate. Nonetheless, we always do a gear. In this case, why not? Just in case someone's going to say that it's a problem, do the gear. Now, Chances are, if it's a woman in 20 years, she will not marry a Cohen. So the other one will become irrelevant. She does, you want to turn around and say, she's with terrorist to a Cohen, I we did a Garris 20 years ago. I think the person will be, have broad enough shoulders to say that. So just one more. Uh, this this is the world of tomorrow, for real. This is, this this is the world this of tomorrow. This can't happen for 20 years. 
So another uh, related question. Uh, if the uh, donor, if the, the uh, nuclear mother is a Yisrael and the mitochondrial mother is a, is a Kohen, would that impact on the chiyuv of Pidyon Ben? And would you say a bracha on the Pidyon Ben? <laughs> that's too much. Rav doesn't have to answer that one. <laughs> no, 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 so that's, why is that important? That could be next year, after 20 years. Right, from right, that's true. For marry a Pidyon Ben, for marry you need 20 years, but to... Uh, Pidyon Ben is the 30 days, year. right. I would be willing to make a bracha on the Pidyon Ben. <laughs> <laughs> That's 100% true. I'd like to postpone the answer to your question to, we, have, we made up, we're gonna discuss four topics. Topic number, either three or four, whichever you decide, should we talk about it now or should we should wait for that? Maybe this way, because there's just a few right. things to finish. Well, I want to finish by the kind which we'll is the first half of our discussion. If we forget, for the end, please raise your hand, and I want to talk get about it. Get back to fertility and egg right. freezing right. and things like this. Yes? Is it a given that it's the woman's mitochondria that becomes the child's, or can the man's Oh, that's part of that's an ex 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 no, that's a segue to part right, two. Right, it's a segue to part two. Hold, hold that question for me for one moment. So I will definitely return to that question very, very shortly. But just, just to throw in a few additional things before we move to part two of mitochondria, which we're really not going to discuss halakhically, but just for food for thought for the future. Um, this, this is on the, the uh, tales of the major halachic debate, whether the birth mother or the genetic mother is considered the halachic mother. This puts a, uh, a uh, twist, if you will, into the genetic mother. Um, but there is additional technology or understanding uh, which now questions uh, the determination that uh, the birth mother is the halachic mother or should be the halachic mother. What do I mean? Uh, until now, it has basically been assumed by almost all, I would say even all poskim, that the birth mother is simply an incubator for the child. Uh, and those for sure who hold that the genetics is the determinant hold that the birth mother really has no genetic contribution. Uh, but there is an evolving science called the science of epigenetics. Uh, I apologize if I ask you just for, for our knowledge, how many people are familiar with the science of epigenetics? So a fair number of you are, are familiar with the science of epigenetics. And in essence, uh, it's really, uh, it, it completely revolutionized our understanding of DNA. We always thought that DNA was just communicated through the classic codes of DNA. Now there's an understanding that there's a whole, literally an entire level of the, uh, uh, of the transmission of DNA, which we haven't really fully understood, so that it's possible to have events that transpire in someone's life, which can have genetic effects on future generations. Uh, not as direct as classic genetic transmission from the sperm and eggs, but it is possible for a woman who is carrying a child to uh, experience some physiological change, even some perhaps emotional change, which could have an, a direct genetic impact on that child. I'm not just talking if you smoke or if you drink or if you take drugs. I'm talking a genetic impact which could be transmissible to all future generations. So we're not going to discuss that, but just food for thought that, uh, that will impact perhaps the post scheme who completely negated the gestational mothers having no shaykhs whatsoever to maternity might need to reconsider that position. Um, and it'll, it'll be bottle as, as well. You think it'll be bottle as well? I have to make okay. one. Assuming there's only one mother. Right, right. More than one mother, then all bets are off. Uh, the, other, the other area which is a little futuristic, but since we're in the world of tomorrow, may as well just mention it. Again, we're not going to discuss the potential health ramifications, and they are many, uh, is that for those who hold that the, uh, the, the gestational mother is indeed the halachic mother, and don't give credence to the genetic component, uh, there is technology developing towards a, uh, what's called ectogenesis, uh, which literally means gestating the fetus outside the womb. Uh, and there's been some significant advances in this field at, uh, at CHOP, Children's Hospital Philadelphia. They, ha they gestated a, a goat uh, at a very, very early uh, gestational age. And it literally, it looks like 
a plastic bag that you'd buy. I don't know if you ever do uh, when you when you want to pack and you need to uh, pack and uh, close your, 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 your the vacuum vacuum sealed bags. It literally looks like a vacuum sealed bag with a, with an animal inside. And they were able to gestate it for a relatively long period of time. The ultimate objective, which may transpire in our lifetimes, uh, is that it may be possible to gestate the fetus completely ex utero from, from conception until, uh, I'm pausing here because it really isn't birth, because there wouldn't be a birth. Right, so, so there are questions that need to be considered for perhaps for, a, for another entire session. Would it be even a human being? Because according to the Chacham Svi, perhaps, you know, it, uh, it has to be man of woman born, uh, for those of you familiar with the Macbeth uh, reference. Um, I joke and say in this case it would be man of womb born. Um, but that's, so those are things to think about. But let us return to, uh, to the second aspect of our mitochondrial. This is the year of the mitochondria. How else is that impact on halacha in a, in a very important, very halacha lamaisa way, not so hypothetical and not so rare as in the, uh, as in the maternity discussion? Uh, in order to understand this, just a little bit of background. <clears throat> the, uh, how many people here are familiar with the Kohen gene? You guys familiar with the Kohen gene? So the Kohen gene, uh, this, it's actually the same person who's involved in this research, Dr. Skoretsky uh, from, uh, from Haifa, um, I believe he himself is a Cohen. Remember, is he a Cohen? I don't remember. But anyway, he was in Shul one day. He's a scientist in Rambam and Haifa. And he decided to, uh, to uh, and, he, and he either saw the Cohen getting an aliyah, and he said to himself, you know, I'm a geneticist, and I deal with population genetics a little bit. I wonder if there's a specific gene which only Kohanim have, because it's transmitted to the male, exclusively uh, to the male. So why don't I look on the Y chromosome, which is transmitted to the male, and, uh, and see if, this, uh, if there's any commonality. And lo and behold, you know, he found that there was some commonality between Ashkenazim and Sephardim. There was some unique, he called, called it the Kohen modal haplotype. There was some unique genetic code which was found, not in all Kohanim, but in many Kohanim. And that was a flurry for a little while. That research is still being done. Uh, there, there, uh, we could talk about potential halachic ramifications for that, but you know, Lamaisa doesn't have that many halachic ramifications. Um, but that's a paternally transmitted gene. There, is a, there are genes which are exclusively transmitted maternally only. And I'll, and I'll answer your question, I'll, and I'll answer your question. The, uh, these mitochondrial DNA that we talk about that are defective are only transmitted maternally from mother to child. The mother can transmit it to both the, the male and the female children, but only the female can transmit it to subsequent generations. Now you may ask me, doesn't the male have mitochondria and there's zera? What happens to the male mitochondria? Indeed, there is mitochondria, or there are mitochondria in the male zera, but those don't get transmitted. Those are used in the process of conception, they get destroyed in the process of conception, uh, fertilization. But they don't get transmitted on to future generations. So this mitochondria, uh, so there is a way now to potentially take advantage of the fact that there is a unique set of genes which is transmitted from mother to child, mother to child. And, and I'll tell you an extraordinary application of this in the non-Jewish world. And we'll relate it to, the, uh, to, to our halachic world for, for a response to, by, by, by Willie Shlita. Um, how many of you, are, we had a Shakespeare reference to Macbeth. How many are familiar with the play Richard III? Okay, Richard III. Richard III, how many of you have visited the grave of Richard III? You will not have visited the, Richard, the grave because it, it, until recently it didn't exist. So if you go to England, many of the kings and queens, we know their burial places. Until recently, no one knew where Richard III was buried. He was, he was an outcast. He was ostracized from British history. Uh, he was killed on the battlefield. Nobody ever knew where he was buried. Uh, to make a long story short, someone did some extraordinary archaeological and genealogical research and found a site in Leicester, England, under a, an existing modern parking lot. They found an old church from 500 years ago, uh, and they, they uh, found the burial ground in the church, and in that burial ground, they found an area in the church which is dedicated to, to people who are important uh, people, and they found the uh, bones there of a man who had severe kyphoscoliosis. What does that mean? That means he was a hunchback. And if you read Shakespeare, you'll know that Richard III was, was thought to be a hunchback. In addition, he had trauma to the skull, all consistent with the history of the death of Richard III. 
what was the only way they could prove that it was actually Richard III? is through DNA. So what did they decide to do? They decided to do genealogical research to find existing relatives today that were maternal relatives, bas achar bas, from the time of Richard III until, until today. And they found two existing relatives. And they took the mitochondrial DNA of these bones and the mitochondrial DNA of these two existing relatives, and the match for both of them was 99 plus percent. So this was a definitive genetic proof that, that, this, uh, that these bones were indeed the bones of Richard III. They exhumed them, they reburied them, they had a whole ceremony, which uh, I don't think any of you attended. But uh, so the, the, what, what does that tell us? That tells us that you can actually trace maternal genes. How is this relevant for us in, uh, in halacha? So I'll give a very concrete way, and then, and then we'll I'll, I'll ask her of the following Shiloh, then we'll move to the, to the next Shiloh, which is, which is real halacha ma'isa. Let's say your son is in college, and he comes home one day, and he says, uh, you know, uh, Abba, Ima, I have, I have good news, I have bad news. You know, I, I found a girl uh, that I fall in love with, but she's not Jewish. But we send a cheek swab to these uh, genetic uh, uh, testing, and we found out that her mitochondrial DNA matches exactly to the mitochondrial DNA of a Jewish woman from 100 years ago. Exact match. So this is an exact match case. So the question is, is this woman halachically Jewish? Can she switch out her cross for her Jewish star? Or uh, does she have to undergo a gayrus? She's been raised as a Catholic her whole life. Her parents have been raised as Catholic. Nobody knows anything about Judaism. No connection to Judaism. They don't have any you know, old cemeteries where my great-great-grandfather was Jewish. Nothing. All they have is the identical mitochondrial DNA to an existing, which is a different case than this. This is, this is a stronger case. What is the Rev? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting the Rev on the spot. No, why is it a question? What, what's the difference between that and someone who was raised from a Jewish woman where she had no Jewish background in upstate New York? No, but this is a person who has no practice. The, the question is, what are the halachic determinants for, for, for uh, Judaism. So obviously someone who, uh, I mean, this obviously, I'm not uh, okay. Can we use DNA to determine Judaism? Is DNA sufficient to allow the criteria for Judaism? That's the question. The question as the point, is that a permissible So we all know, let, let me just go take a little step back. We all know that DNA is a subject of tremendous controversy among the halachists. In an unfortunate incident, I was involved <coughs> significantly after the terrible events of 9-11. On our best, we had eight, eight cases of women who wanted to remarry. And some of them, uh, the one case, the most difficult personal case for me was a one, a Tom of mine, who was one of the victims. And in his case, unique to all the cases that we had, among the, all eight, he was the only one we had absolutely no proof that he was even in the building. All the other case, we knew he was in the Can't have Fitzgerald, or could they have gotten out? No, no. We had no idea he was even in the building. I mean, we knew in our heart that he was in the building. He left home and he went to work, but there was no, no one saw him in the building. For months, we were wrestling with this case, what we do. Finally, just before Pesach, they found a DNA match. And the Pesach Halacha came, it's sufficient. Again, a combination of circumstances. We know there was a terrible event in, in the World Trade Center that his wife was permitted to remarry. And in fact, she did. We actually had to do a chalitza in that case as well. So I'm very familiar with the DNA situation. And I believe that it's reliable. Of course, we could not have given up Pesach. We got confirmation from Zahm and Chemi Goldberg and others that the DNA match was sufficient to allow a very, this is a much worse, this is HSH, this is the most serious halachic prohibition that exists, potentially. And nonetheless, we permit it, again, in combination with the circumstances, we assume that this was uh, reliable. So let's go back to our case, your case. 
Here, there are no circumstances. There's no reason in the world to assume this woman is Jewish. None. Her history is Catholic. There's no, no recollection of any Jewish forebears whatsoever. So you want to rely exclusively on the DNA. Uh, not so simple. Not so simple. I, I, again, I cannot equate it with the case we discussed earlier. Of course, let's be real. The stakes are lower. We're not discussing an Easter of Asia's ish, of, uh, of adultery, which is the most serious violation. Not that I'm minimizing the violation of intermarriage. That's certainly a very significant violation, but this doesn't rise to the level of, of adultery. If I was presented with this case of this uh, collegiate, my response would be, if he's saying the words Abba Ima, I mean, he knows Hebrew, and the parents are, are, are knowledgeable from the halakhic perspective, I'd say, well, Sonny boy, do you want to lead a halakhic life? Put aside the girl. Do you want to keep Shabbos? Do you want to keep Kashrus? I mean, how, do, how do you want to lead your life? And that's a much more basic question before you get to a girl. I mean, he's only in college, so he's not getting married yet. So he says, you know, I'm, I'm questioning and I'm searching, and we, have, we find this too, unfortunately too frequently in the colleges. That's one of the reasons why I want us to come to this college, okay? Because you know, other colleges, <laughs> it's a serious problem, a very, very serious problem. If the young man could be brought around, or maybe he's there already, that he wants to keep showers, he wants to keep cautious, the way to go would be to take this young lady and say, yeah, lady, nice to meet you. I said that you may be one of us, you may be a Jewish from your great, 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 great grandmother, but that's been forgotten. And Rav Shechta always passes in these cases, you have to do a Geras anyway, even if you knew for a fact, you had the full chain, for 10 generations, to a Jewish mother, but if they practice Catholic, you as Catholics, as, as, as a din de Rabbon, you know, de Rabbon, and you require a Geras, because the Meshumet, quoted in Shulchan Aruch and Yerodeah. So the answer is simple, if she's willing to go along and to lead a, a from lifestyle. Then the answer, in fact, it really is simple. She has to have a garrison anyway, with the Rabbana, even if she was really Jewish. And now she's going to be from, we'll do a real garrison just to make sure, just in case she really wasn't Jewish. That would be the solution. The problem is what if she doesn't really want to go along completely. So you run into situations in which some rabbis are doing these conversions en masse. That's a sad fact. Or I'm talking about Orthodox rabbis are converting individuals without fulfillment of mitzvahs on a daily basis. That's another problem which we deal with in a different part of the world, which is very serious and sad. If she's willing to make some type of move, even if she's not going to be completely observant, there was a response from an Igris Moshe of Rav Moshe a long time ago. He says, well, maybe the Geiris is valid. Probably not, but maybe yes. And he would even encourage an Orthodox rabbi to do it because the person is going to get married to Jewish Lee anyway. So what I would say in that case is since there are, there's a chance that the gay would work even in suboptimal conditions, which I, really, I would never do such a gay myself. But if I have the combination of your factor of the maternal mitochondria, which indicates scientifically that this person is Jewish in the first place, I would do such a gay that's how I would handle it. So it is rare today that we would have this kind of scenario because we simply don't have the database of existing mitochondrial DNA that an individual would be a match to previous generations. But there is research that's being done for the following. And here's the stimulus for this research. There are thousands upon thousands of Jews from the, from, uh, in Russia now, the former Soviet Union, that, uh, that want to return to their Yahadus, but have no history of the practice of their Yahadus. They don't know from their parents if they have any connection to Yahadus, but they're coming to, to, uh, to join Klal Yisrael. And, uh, and the Dayanim, the, uh, the Bate Dinim, the uh, rabbinic uh, courts, are, are in having thousands of people coming to them with the challenge of how do I determine whether they're Jewish or not? Do I need to convert them or are they Jewish? So now, based on this research of mitochondrial DNA, they're adding an additional possible factor which might tip the balance to determine them as being Jewish. 
and how does the mitochondrial DNA fit in? So it is true, we don't have the mitochondrial DNA of previous specific uh, progenitors or, or ancestors of any individual, but we do know that the Jewish population in general, in its totality, are the carriers of certain mutations in the mitochondrial DNA that are common specifically to the Jewish community. And there is research that is being done now testing thousands upon thousands of Jews from across the globe, not only from Eastern Europe, but from Western Europe, from America, from all across the globe. And to see, to test exactly statistically which mutations Jews have, how common is it for a Jew to have this mutation? How specific is it that if a Jew carries this mutation in their mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally transmitted, that it means that they are indeed Jewish? And this data is being presented as we speak to the Bate Dinim in Eretz Yisrael, to the Gedoli Aposkim in Eretz Yisrael, uh, to, to add as an additional factor to be able to determine whether indeed an individual who comes to the Beis Din to, 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 uh, to get the stamp that you are indeed a Jew, whether that can tip the scales and, and be used in that, uh, in that way. So normally I would be a, a ignorant of all this, but this past summer in Camp Arasha, we had the uh, privilege of having a very distinguished uh, guest. His name is Rabbi Dr. Avram Steinberg, very, very noted uh, rabbi and doctor. And he presented me with this book. He spoke about this, he spoke to the Kolo. This book, a thick book, it's all about this. It's called Bire Yadut, on the basis of this phenomenon. After reading this and reading some other articles that Dr. Rachman showed me, I got an impression Again, it's, it's, I'm talking just approximately, that the chances are 300 times greater that this person is Jewish than non Jewish. It was a 986 to 3, somewhere in, in the middle of a statistical mix. It's not definitive, but it's you know, almost definitive. And therefore, can you paskin la halacha that this person is Jewish, even though this. And in Russia, remember, they had no birth certificates and they had no, no radical records, nothing. Can you pass it based on this exclusively? I give you the same answer I gave you before. I wouldn't do so. Uh, there's a children here from Russia Weiss who all said he wouldn't do so. He would include it as a significant factor in combination with other factors. Now, that's, of course, a very broad statement. But from my perspective, I'll do exactly the same as I told you before. Many situations of the uh, Jews from Russia who come to Eretz Yisrael, that's where the main uh, focal point is, and they're Megaya them wholesale. They convert them wholesale. We all know, what well, was willing to not be, uh, put his, close his eyes, that the overwhelming majority are not observant. Not to the level of really keeping Shabbos, really keeping, let's just look the Shabbos. So they do it anyway in the Israeli, uh, but they did. And that's part of the whole fight that's going on in the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael. I would say the same thing over here. I wouldn't do such a gerus. they not to show them I wouldn't do it. But, if I had the mitochondrial DNA, which gives a chance of 300 to 1 that the person is Jewish, I would do such a conversion. Same as I did with the one UKD case, I would do in this case as well. That's what I would do, but of course I'm living in Riverdale and this fight is going on in Jerusalem, so what I would do is not so relevant in the broader perspective of things. There you go. It's a question. If I can take your scenario one generation further, so the last got the boy, now went ahead and married her, and 19 years later, this young boy walks into Chabad House on campus and says, I want to put on this film. And the Shulia from Chabad House says, are you Jewish? And he says, well, here's my genetic record. I can prove that my mother's 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 mother was Jewish. But they didn't get a gay risk, you mean? But yeah, didn't. Didn't get a gay risk, so, yeah. So, would you give him a reason for that? <laughs> yes. Because the, that's a, that's a balance, a risk benefit, cost benefit. I would say yes. Question of the risk down the line, you know, saying that is it 
we're assuming that all these children were produced naturally. Here's an excellent question. Right. You put two pieces together, you get to a contradiction. Right, 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 right. This stuff hasn't happened yet, really. Down the road, in a thousand years from now, I'll be in the world of tomorrow. We have to worry about the fact that the mitochondria came from a Jew, but the nucleus came from an non-Jew. So that's, <laughs> these are excellent questions, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, I would ask the Rav, you know, at what stage, if, when, when the Rav is Masad or Kedushin, do you have to start saying, are you a product of assisted reproduction? And if so, that's a general in what variation right. permutation? That's, that's a general That's a general uh, question. I don't ask the question at this point. But, but there may come a time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been discussed among the rabbis. Maybe we should ask every single couple that come to us, are you... Some of the answers, they don't even know the answer to the question. Not every person who they're comes to They're told. They're not always told. Not always told. Right, exactly. that's another that's issue. another issue. Right, right. that's another issue. Huh? Right, correct. They're not correct. told. Correct. not told. What is it to ask every person? I'm sorry, you, sorry? Said, you said we ask every person that comes to us. We do not. We, I ask many questions when a couple comes to me, but I don't ask them, <coughs> Mr. and Mrs., are, are you produced naturally by your parents? Now, if I ask them, they'll say, well, we assume so. No one told us differently. By now, there are a significant number of people conceived through IVF who are ready to get married. No question. That now for sure, in 20 years from now, for sure, for sure. Most, actually most, many of them are coming from IVF of the husband and the wife. So it's, it's, it's not relevant. But there are also many where there's a donor egg and people don't know about it. I'll just give an example, which is not directly on point. I was a, I have a Talmud whose wife had no eggs. They didn't know about this trick, so they went and got a donor egg from a non-Jew. And at the bris, I was standing by the bris, and they did a regular bris. I never look at a bris, I'm afraid I'm going to faint. But I did look at this one because I felt that this child needs a conversion. So they did a regular bris, and they made a regular bracha for a Jewish child. I don't know who knew what. It wasn't in my shul. <laughs> it wasn't my responsibility. But this is going to happen more and more often. So you are right. It's an excellent question. Said, put this in a safety deposit box. In any case, if it someday will be. Not true. So, yeah. Yeah. The claim was made that a bunch of passes that the birth mother was the mother, not the, not the egg mother. This is about 35 years ago. Yeah, so I never heard that. I never heard that. Huh? Later. Okay. <laughs> the surrogate is the mother? Oh, yeah? The surrogate. That, that means the older yeah. birth mother. So the, the, the birth mother. 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 Add them to the list of notable rabbis because it's yeah, not a publicly known fact. <laughs> to my knowledge. Okay. <laughs> That's what I Okay. okay. Good. All right. Uh, while we're on this topic, we'll do the, do the next topic. Okay. Just, just a thought to ponder, by the way, that while at the same time that we are working on genetic identification through mitochondrial DNA, we are also doing transfer of mitochondrial DNA, which prevents the ability to use that mitochondrial DNA for genetic determination that's of exactly, yadis. That's a thousand points. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, do you understand that? Uh, that's, that's a rarity. Um, so, you know, continuing along this, this, uh, this theme, if you look at number five on your handout, um, the first case of a child born from eggs frozen before puberty. Uh, so we're going to talk now about uh, cryopreservation or the freezing of reproductive material, in particular the freezing of, of, uh, of the female egg. Um, historically, the female, the male zera has been able to be frozen for many, many decades, since the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, after that followed the ability to freeze the fertilized egg, or the fertilized embryo, the zygote. It's only the last few years that scientists have been able to freeze just the human ovum by itself. 
Uh, and the main reason why it's been so complicated and taken so long is because the physiological structure of the human egg is comprised mostly of water. Uh, and it's hard to freeze and thaw out that structure without it being destroyed. Uh, but scientists have, have uh, over the last couple of years, and there's different methods which are not relevant for our discussion, but the bottom line is it's doable. Not only is it doable, you see a woman had her eggs frozen even before puberty, the first time uh, ever, and they're able to be used later on in life. So how does this impact the Jewish community? It impacts the Jewish community very directly and very concretely. Um, there is a so-called shidduch crisis that uh, you, uh, if you're on any modern Orthodox mailing list, you will invariably get uh, a couple emails a month on the, uh, on the shidduch crisis. So there are many women that um, you know, have found shidduchim, many that have not yet found their shidduch, many that will find their shidduchim at a later stage in life, where they may not have the same fertility rates that they would have had earlier in life. So now it is possible for a woman to freeze her eggs preferably when she is younger, and to maintain those eggs frozen, the Mir Hashem, she should, uh, whenever she finds her shidduch and gets married, uh, she can use those eggs for fertility purposes, and she could even use those eggs and carry the child herself even after menopause, in theory. Uh, obviously, the fertilization would take place in the laboratory, but then the egg could be implanted into the woman even if she's postmenopausal. So is this something that we should be encouraging as Jews? Is this something we should be discouraging? Uh, is this something which is going to appear on the Shirach resume? Um, you know, frozen eggs uh, on the column. I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it's, it's, it's not so crazy. It's not so crazy. It's, it's hypothetically possible. So, uh, so that's the question. Yes, for the uh, this has been a very serious matter. Uh, I wanted to just take a step backwards. Um, there's a very wonderful organization in Israel called Machon Pua, which is involved in these kinds of situations. And Rabbi Brustein, who runs it, who founded it, called me and said, we have to be proactive in encouraging freezing of eggs. I said, why? He said, because there's another alternative. The other alternative is a woman hits the magic age, whatever it may be, late 30s, early 40s, and she sees that the Shaduchim are not coming and this time is going to run out of her. So unfortunately, she just decides to have a child without marriage. It's happened too many times in our community. She goes, I want to have a child. I can't find a husband. So I'll get a, a, donor, a donor sperm and I'll have a child. And they have with the, come with the, the irrefutable logic. If Rabbi Feinstein was so considerate of those women who have no children, even though they were married to Ruve, he said that if they have spermination from Shimon, that the child is a kosher child. How much more so, I am not married to anybody if I have the sperm from Ruve or Shimon for that matter, doesn't matter that the child should be a kosher child. And that is an irrefutable piece of logic. The child is certainly a kosher child. Having said that, Rabbi Bush, it was screaming, we cannot allow this to become a pattern in our community. Because this is the end of Kalal Yisrael. If once we separate having children from marriage, it is a, a churban, a destruction of the entire Jewish family unit as we know it. So therefore, notwithstanding this irrefutable logic, we can allow a woman who's married to Reuben who can have no children to have a sperm donor of Shimon and have a child in the marital unit of this woman with Reuben. We're going to bring up the child as their child. He knows, doesn't know, we're not going to that right now. At the same time, strongly discourage a woman who is single from uh, becoming pregnant and having her own child. But she's screaming, help! So the alternative is freezing the eggs. So if we can say that freezing the eggs is permissible, then a woman comes to us, you know, at the end of her, her fertility years, I'm approaching the end, and I want to have a child, and I, you know, I, 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 it's, are you forcing me, Rabbi, to have a child out of wedlock? I said, no. 
keep looking for the right Mr. Right, keep looking, 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 and looking. Freeze your eggs. When you find Mr. Right, try to have a shell naturally, because you know, people get, uh, it's not premenopausal, even if late in the 40s, people have had children, we all know that. If that fails, we have the eggs there to have the child from that individual, and it, it's only a, a tongue-in-cheek joke that it can become relevant for shidduch resumes. Right. A woman is 43 years old, she wants to get married, and she's looking for someone who's uh, 48 years old. He wants to have a child, she's 43. They you do the stats, 43. Some yes, some no, it's, it's iffy, it's this and it. No problem, check a box. I have the, I have the frozen egg, so that if, 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 that, if it won't work the regular way, and she could even be 50, as you said. Right, it's most so yeah, like, 60, 60. Oh, let's not get carried away. <laughs> 65, 67. Not, not such a good idea 60, for other reasons. 68, whatever it may be. But whatever, she's probably, yeah. she's an age which is presumed, I think average menopause is 51, right? Is that correct? So she's over 50, and she can put on her resume, yes, my age, I'm not gonna lie about my age, it should, should be lying on this resume, it's 52 <laughs> years old, but in a footnote, HFE, half frozen eggs. So that could be a real, in my opinion, and again with the encouragement of Rabbi Burstein, I think it's permissible. I've spoken about it publicly in a couple of occasions, uh, saying that it's, it's permissible. So at what age should I do this? I can't answer that question. Someone inside of 35, there's some, obviously it's much better if she has a regular shidduch and it has, reproduces all that, it's, it's trauma of, and expense of, of these egg freezings. But I'm not here to judge. If she feels at 35, it's already getting too close. But there are, as we well know, early menopause, and unfortunately, I would say it's permissible. The question is, if, uh, if that's the psaac, is there, would the Rav, for example, give a proviso that if, if, if unfortunately, the woman isn't able to find a shidduch, that she could not use the eggs for, uh, for fertilization outside of wedlock, because the possibility exists for her post-menopausal to still have her own child out of wedlock. If she, again, if she's listening to me all the way, not only halfway, <laughs> I would say that if, if, if it reaches a point in her life when she understands that she's not going to find a, a marriage partner, that should be destroyed. Now, I, I actually, uh, we, we are supposed to uh, conclude uh, exactly on time at 12.45. Does anyone have any uh, questions, either of the topics that we discussed? You have to discuss topic number four, maybe the most important of all. Which, which, one, which one was? 40 days. Oh, okay, very important. Thank you. Thank the Rev for reminding me. Very important. Must, must mention, even if we go a minute or two over. Um, the landscape of uh, another major topic, which has been in the uh, halachic, medical halachic literature for decades, is the permiss for centuries, is the permissibility of performing an abortion, uh, if ever and if yes, under what circumstances. Um, so the famous uh, debate between uh, the Tzitz Eliezer and Zatzal and, and Moshe Zatzal uh, going back to the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, who were at polar extremes, uh, Tzitz Eliezer being very permissive and, uh, and, and Moshe Zatzal uh, not allowing abortion under, uh, under any circumstances unless the mother's life was at risk, definitely for no fetal reasons, definitely not if the, if the fetus was affected. But the landscape uh, is affected for some post scheme if you are able to determine the disability of the child at a very early embryological stage. So, so halacha does acknowledge that before 40 days, the fetus is considered maya alma, mere, mere water. Uh, until now, it has been virtually impossible to obtain valuable genetic information before that period of time. So it, it has had no halachic relevance. Uh, the future holds the following, that if, if uh, that scientists have identified that some of the fetal cells migrate from the fetal circulation into the maternal circulation, literally sometimes a handful of cells, generally the circulations are separate. Now scientists are able to identify a little bit of that DNA in the bloodstream of the woman and use it for some, some limited circumstances. But the possibility exists in the very near future that they'll be able literally to extract the entire fetal genome from the maternal circulation and even at a pretty early age, even before 40 days. Now keep in mind the 40 day mark in halacha is different from the 40 days that your OBGYN tells you. 40 days the GYN tells you is 40 days from the last menstrual period. The 40 days from halacha is 40 days from conception. So the question is if we can now get this information less than 40 days, how will that change the landscape of the permissibility of abortion? 
The reason I wanted to talk about it in specifics is because this has a long history. In the mid-70s, we suffered through the terrible, what does that mean, now five minutes? I'll be finished in less Great. than five minutes. Thank you for the five minutes. <laughs> I'll look at my watch. The terrible scourge of Tay-Sachs was rampant in the mid-70s. And Rav Shefta Shlita and I went to the same pediatrician, Dr. Donald Gribitz of Blessed Memory, who practiced in Mount Sinai, was a well-known, famous pediatrician. And he he's caught after help. It was terrible. It was before Dar Yashar. Terrible. So Rabbi Shefta told him, find me a way to determine it's before 40 days. And then before 40 days, there's much more flexibility. Even some of the authorities were more strict post 40 days, because they view it as ritzicha, as, as murder, might be more lenient, less than 40 days, because if it hasn't been, it's called Maya Be'ama, it's hard to consider that to be ritzicha. Although some, some Paul's can say it makes no difference, but there are many others who say it does make a difference. So then it was only uh, Andrew's and thesis, forget it, we're getting close. A few years later, you'll tell me how many years later, they started something called CVS, Chorionic Field Sampling. Sampling at the beginning, they did it in less than 40 days. I should say one more thing. 40 days is a minimum. Look at Hilchus Pinyan Aben, Shinhei and Yeridea, the Pisgah Tshuva quotes. It's 40 days and Nisrakmu Eivorov, which means 40 is a minimum. You also need the formation of limbs, which nowadays can be determined by a sonogram. So it could be 50 days easily. It's not, 40 is not necessarily the absolute limit. And they were doing it at that point in time, especially in CHAP, that was the main place where they did it very early. And we said, you know, oh, now we have that possibility. Unfortunately, the CVS is so millimeter precise, you make a mistake of a millimeter, you chop off a finger or a hand, and they stop doing it early, I think, everywhere. I don't think it's done early in the no. U.S. anyway. Now they have to wait a much longer time than 40 days. So back to square one. That's why I was so animated when, for the first time I discovered when Dr. Reichman sent me his, his, his program last week. I never knew about this before. We're back to a possibility of a pre-40 day test which can determine definitively a child has a fatal disease. So once again, we're back to where we were 40 years ago where there are Rabbonim who would say that in that situation there is room to be lenient. Again, I want to be upfront. There may be rabbis who will say, I don't care before 40 days. It makes no difference whatsoever. They consider it prohibited no matter what. But there is a body of opinion. It goes back to Reb Chaim Oyser, and there are great rabbis who do make the distinction between before or after 40 days in this context. Of course, it leads to another issue, which we don't have time to discuss right now. What if it's a non-fatal disease? Tay-Sex is the worst. The worst. I don't know anything worse, anything worse than that. But there is the whole continuum. I'm dealing just now with CF, cystic fibrosis. Yeah, it's complicated. People came to me just, just, just a few days ago. It's much more complex, and the, and the list continues. So I don't want to say anything definitive, especially since it's still the world of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. To my knowledge, it's, this process has not yet been... Not yet, no, not in its fullest. So I'm very happy that the other things we spoke about, although the world of tomorrow, have relevance to literally today. This is the world that will end. We have to end in time. It the world of tomorrow. But when tomorrow comes, I'll be able to with a simple blood test of the mother to determine a very significant defect in the child she's carrying. In my opinion, if it's less than 40 days, there's much more room to be lenient. Just, just to conclude, I want to thank Rabbi Willig very much. It's tremendous as Chris to have uh, Rabbi Willig. Um, as we close, one of the other technologies or, or aspects they're working on is the longevity gene. <laughs> So actually, some, uh, the, some scientists in, in Eretz Yisrael think that if you notice the longevity, and we're now in Sefer Bratius, if you notice the longevity of all the people in Bratius, it starts out very, very high, then it gradually declines till it hits, you know, 120. So they postulate that Kosh Baruch Hu introduced into the human genome a gene which limits longevity. So scientists now are trying to find that gene and return, <laughs> return us to the old longevity. So Ritz Hashem, they find that, we'll be having these discussions for another 850 800 years. years. <laughs>